what does technology want? I'm gonna think about wants in a particular way. I wanna say humans have wants. Those wants are supplied by a market or maybe induced by the market within the constraints of the law. So wants we have to see as bracketed by these three separate dimensions I wanna talk about each in the time I have with you today. Let's start with humans. Think of humans as bodies and recognize those bodies get hacked. Hacked in a very specific sense, taken over by systems or by intelligence with alien purpose, alien to you. Let's call that body hacking. And it's not science fiction. Think, for example, about food. And by food, I don't mean food like this. I mean food instead like this, or this, or this, or this, or especially this. Behold, indeed, the magic of the buffalo wing, the perfect mix of salt, sugar, and fat to make that food addictive. It's a miracle in the sense that Tide is a miracle because it's a choice, a design choice by food scientists, food architects working in their labs to make the most addictive product they can. Michael Moss in his book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, describes this industry of food science, which is a science, a science designed to engineer food to overcome a natural resistance so you can't stop the consumption of this food. That's body hacking, exploiting evolution with an aim. And what is the aim? Well, here's where we need to bring in dimension two, markets. Because the aim, of course, is to sell food or sell quote unquote food to make money. Now, for some, of course, this is harmless. We have all sorts of people who eat this food without any apparent harm to them. But to others, it is not harmless. This food addicts them, walks them down a path that's extraordinarily unhealthy for them while profitable for the industries that supply them. That's idea one, body hacking. Here's idea two, it follows pretty directly, brain hacking. Tristan Harris is a former Google engineer. He started the Center for Humane Technology. The center is focused on the science and engineering science, the engineering of attention. It's the engineering of the attention to overcome resistance. And it's the resistance, not of our bodies, but of our brains. The means here are exactly the same. Exploiting evolution just so happens that we have evolved to be extremely sensitive to random rewards and they exploit that feature to capture us. It just so happens we have evolved to be extremely sensitive to bottomless pits of content. And so they have evolved that too to overcome our resistance. Overcoming resistance addicting us with the aim obviously to make money. Now they make money mainly from ads, not just from ads, but mainly from ads. And ads are relatively new in the life of the internet. When Google was born more than 20 years ago, its founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, told the world advertising-funded search engines will be inherently biased towards the advertisers and away from the needs of the consumers. But then their board informed them that unfunded search engines will be biased against Google's investors. So they quickly came up with a genius in the sense of an evil genius idea, captured perfectly in the tag given to us by Shoshana Zuboff, surveillance capitalism. And the idea was basically this, let's find a way to spy on our users. And I don't mean spy in an Orwellian 1984 sense, but instead machines which collect and sort and understand what we think of as the digital exhaust, our mouse droppings as we move across the internet for the purpose of better understanding what users want. But not just by watching what the users do, not just passively sitting back and seeing how we interact, by active poking, tweaking, asking us questions, rendering us vulnerable, reaching down the brain stack to leverage our emotional insecurity for the purpose of inducing us to reveal more. This is the business of Instagram and Facebook as they present these images of beautiful lives of all of our friends leading us to wonder why aren't my experiences as beautiful or as happy, forcing us to reveal more and more so we get the feedback that would make us respond in the way we want to feel. So we mouse droppings more.
so they see more, so they can sell more or sell better. Here too, they are exploiting features of us, us humans, to give them power, to induce us to give them what they need. And what they need makes them rich, makes the internet possible, the internet of today. It is a win-win, the entrepreneurs tell us, except that it's not. Because there are unintended, let's at least hope they're unintended, unintended side effects of the surveillance. For individuals, as some are drawn into a web of addiction that sometimes leads to tragic consequences, but not just for individuals, for societies as well. As people get driven to behave in ways that's almost inconceivable but for the crazy inducements of this technology. Now, my aim here is not to condemn the technology in general. Indeed, my aim here is to complexify our understanding of surveillance capitalism. Because the reality is this technology, maybe like every technology, is Janus face. It has benefits and it has costs. The benefits are more efficient commerce, the opportunity for many more people to produce and sell products to people all across the world because of this platform of information enabled by the surveillance technology. This argument Facebook is trying to press right now, here's one of their latest submissions. People have ideas, ideas are all around. You watch them, bad them, ride them into town. And yet for every big idea that grows to wild acclaim, there are so many more that never find their fame. And some might seem bizarre to you, and some are only for a few. But many are small businesses that simply lack the tool to find excited people who will stop and say, that's cool. There's an idea for everyone, and you'll love yours. She'll love hers too. These two get served up coffee, cause they adore the brew. You're the type who needs the crew or likes your pants and vivid hue. Behold, it's there. These bikers got some new head with small businesses and people make connections so profound. And all this personalized and help good ideas get found. So there are benefits, yes. But there are costs too, social costs. And cost in many contexts, but especially the one I want to focus on here, is the cost for democracy. Because it just turns out, unfortunately for us, that the best strategy, the best surveillance capital strategy in the citizenship domain, the democracy domain, is to fuel the politics of hate. And indeed, the most profit for these platforms occurs to them if they can drive us to be as polarized and ignorant here as possible. It turns out that angry, emotional, and false speech spreads faster, is better than, from this profit perspective, pleasant, factual, true speech. And so the point is, this is a business model that's driven or committed to making us stupid. And not just in the context of the internet. This is a graph that measures the ideological content of the three major cable networks in the United States, Fox, CNN and MSNBC. And what it shows is around 2001, there's no real ideological difference between these three networks. But since 2001, these networks have learned they make more money if they can segment us into tribes and to feed us our tribal story to reinforce our identity within those tribes. The business model here profits from harming us as a democracy. Now, here's the link I want you to make. This body hacking and brain hacking, these two extraordinary features of modern society, these are two business models. They're just business models. They're just ways for corporations to make money. And these business models have critical consequences. What pays them weakens us and weakens our health, our physical, social, and political health. It's less profitable for them. It's less profitable for them to give us what we need in these separate domains. So is there any surprise that we are so unhealthy, at least unhealthy here in America? That tees up the third dimension, the law. Because maybe the law could fix this. And the good news here, of course, is the law is resisting. 
But the bad news is it's resisting, in my view, in all the wrong ways, deploying costly and ineffective interventions that will produce little good and lots of harm. So GDPR and Apple are similar in this sense. Both are waging a war against surveillance. But it's not a war against all surveillance. It's a war against non-consensual surveillance, which of course triggers the sites that would like to surveil to constantly tell us, please give us permission to surveil you. And most of us, the vast majority of us, simply opt in because it's easier to opt in than to bound the hurdles that they give us to give act that access to their content, inducing consent, inducing consent. And yet this consent happens without understanding. We don't really recognize what we're doing when we give away our data. And the point is that then leads us back to close to where we are now, where essentially these data are available for whatever purpose commerce or politics would use them for. Now, my view, the mistake here is we're looking for one rule, uber alles. We're looking for a single solution that we imagine will work everywhere. But the better response is to follow the intuition of the political philosopher Michael Walzer and recognize that we need different rules for different domains. So if we think about the commercial domain as separate from the citizen or democracy domain, what we've seen from surveillance capitalism so far is that in the commercial domain, there is some good. But in the citizen domain, we can see the way the particular technologies induce extraordinary ugliness. And so this separate domain understanding says that we need to step back and stop worrying about some things and start worrying about other things. We need to stop worrying about tracking or surveillance or data in the abstract, uber alles, as if we're talking about it in every domain, and start worrying about use or business model or particular harm in particular contexts. And we need to think about how to regulate use where there is that harm. That's the approach that this separate domain analysis would suggest. And so, in the context of the internet, we could say that in commercial domains, the surveillance should be allowed, at least if regulated within certain limits. But in the democracy domain, it should not be allowed. We should not be allowed to deploy these technologies in a way that facilitate driving us into polarized tribal camps, making the objective of democracy less possible to achieve. Now, that follows in part from the Walzerian principle of separating domains and recognizing where the technology is doing good and distinguishing that from where it's doing bad. But it's driven, in my view, mainly by a practical reality, the recognition that they won't kill the potential profit in the commercial domain in order to protect the democracy or citizen domain. They're not going to give up the internet as it is right now just to protect democracy. So we need a way to separate democracy from the commercial domain as it is right now. And the challenge is how we get there. And my fear is that there's no way to get there. Because the commercial domain won't accept less. They're not going to walk away from the enormous profits they can earn by radicalizing us in the consumption we have of democracy information. And in the citizen domain, we won't acknowledge more. We won't acknowledge that there is actually benefit in at least the context of commerce from these technologies of surveillance. Instead, what we're going to do is find ourselves trapped in this technology that is taking us places we don't want to go, stuck with no way off, leading us or maybe leading the world eventually to the craziness that we have seen in the United States. Now, many people might look at this and say, this is just a United States problem. We don't have to worry about this anywhere else in the world. But we have an idea in the United States called the canary in the coal mine idea. And the basic idea is that when coal miners um, were deep underground, they would bring with them birds, canaries, which when they were singing signaled it was all safe, but when they died signaled there was gas in the mine and they needed to get out. 
I think the world needs to recognize that America is democracy's canary. And that what happens here is just what will happen elsewhere later. And that we in the United States are not so exceptional, which means that the pathologies you see here in the United States are pathologies you need to act to resist elsewhere too. Thanks very much. And we are back live with Professor Lawrence Lissing. Maybe I can use uh, the uh, I can use Larry if you don't mind during our brief discussion. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you for the the effort you put in your video in your talk. This is amazing, and I really want to thank you for the effort. Uh, maybe a first question on my side to start this Q and A, uh, Larry, because I'm European, but uh, it's, maybe it's because I'm European. But we usually make a distinction, a first distinction between public and private when we start talking about the topics that you manipulate. But you didn't use it at all in your talk, so I was wondering how uh, you could articulate this distinction, public versus private, with the, discussion, the distinction that you've made between commercial and citizen domain. And how do you, will you relate uh, those two distinctions? So this will be my first question for you, Larry. Well, I'm not sure the distinction is helpful anymore because we need to recognize the private, what we traditionally think of as the private domain is now dominated by corporations which have enormous power over our private lives. Um, and if we don't think about holding those corporations to public standards, to ideals that we otherwise traditionally have learned to apply to government, we're gonna lose an extraordinary range of freedom and liberty and privacy to the profit incentives of these corporations. So I think it's important for us to spend some time thinking as if all we're talking about are the values that we as individuals should, should protect or should have protected in our society, whether protected against by government or protected um, against by corporations. Okay, thank you very much. A lot of questions related to uh, the same topic. I'm giving you uh, two of them. You, um, the first one will be uh, your talk uh, is paints uh, a pretty grim image. Do you have hope that things are going to turn around before it's too late? And the second is, is there really no way of this train you speak of? You know, um, I have a complicated view about hope. Um, which is I, one part of me is realistic in recognizing we're standing up to the most powerful corporate interest, and more importantly, the business model of the 21st century. Um, so you couldn't imagine um, a more fierce and committed opponent. Um, but the other half of me thinks, what the hell else are we going to do? Um, you know, we can't, we can't give up this fight to uh, achieve some restoration or return to something like the liberty and privacy that we, that we knew before. And, you know, and I think often, you know, one way to think about this is, you know, there are two uh, dystopian uh, uh, images that, that we've inherited, um, one from George Orwell um, and... Uh, Um, and and uh, I think uh, the George Orwell idea um, is actually not the future we need to worry about. Um, instead, the future we need, we need to worry about is, is really one um, that, that is much more focused on the way that these technologies draw us in to want to do the very thing that is most disabling to us. Um, and so when we worry about the uh, dystopia that we're finding ourselves within, the deepest fear I have is that it's going to be too difficult to get people to want to step off and, um, and to actually do something different from, you know, the feed that they're getting from their social, from the, from their social media. Okay. And uh, I'm taking questions as they arrive, so we might switch from topic to another topic. Uh, do you think law is always one step behind the potential harmful effect of technology? For example, it took years to end Napster, even longer to think about, uh, if you think about GDPR, 
which is not still that good, uh, referring to what you said. So concerning the, the, the delay, the fact that the law arrives after, after the events, after the technological facts and business facts. The law is both behind and ahead. Um, it's ahead because I think that we recognize values that we want our society to have. So against the second um, dystopia, the Huxley dystopia, we recognize the value of um, privacy and liberty and, and self-determination, not being manipulated as the puppet master tries to drive us to behave in one way or another. Those ideals are built within our law. Um, they're built you know, from a tradition that spans back to the French Revolution. And that, those ideals, I think, are still within the animating spirit of what you know, policymakers and, and bureaucrats and legislators um, ought to be thinking about. But it's certainly the case that the law is behind, not just because it's slow, but because the vested interests who benefit from the dystopia we see right now are so good at lobbying and manipulating our governments. They are so good at driving them to do exactly the thing that makes it so hard for us to protect ourselves or to restore these ideas of li liberty and privacy. So I think the real challenge we have is, um, is to fight what is really a corruption of a democratic process that could resist these enormously powerful forces that have you know, spread into our lives without anybody ever choosing to make it so. Um, and, and resisting that corruption, you know, which is something that's very, um, endemic in the United States and also throughout Europe is, I think, the biggest challenge we're going to face here. A reference to uh, a book that I don't know. Your ideology seems similar to the one discussed in the book The Society of the West by Jonathan Goldberg. Are you familiar with this work? No, if I'm yes, not. If yes, do you agree? Do you, you don't know it? No, but I will look at it. If it's similar, I would be very eager to follow up. I have no idea either. So... <laughs> um, do, you really need to do we really need to facilitate the uh, open-ended commerce? Or do we need to take a step back from uh, that as well for the sake of sustainability? So this is the biggest, um, I think, intellectual fight right now. Um, there's a kind of modern Luddite version, which, you know, I love the Luddites historically, so I'm not against Luddites in principle, but there's a Luddite version that's like, oh my gosh, let's just blow it all up. Like, why do we really need it? Why don't we just blow up all advertising on the internet? Let's ban it. Like if you banned all of it, banned price discrimination, banned all this advertising, there would be an internet, there would be, you know, uh, something like Facebook. It just wouldn't have the poisoning effect um, of, of that technology. And I, I get the temptation to that response because I do think the threat from these technologies is enormous. And, and you know, 90% of people, I think, have no clue of just exactly how destructive this is. But the more um, optimistic side of me thinks, you know, we ought to be able to manage it better. Um, you know, so there's lots of good that actually could come from uh, much of these data. Um, uh, there's a there's a fantastic researcher at MIT called uh, Sandy Pentlin, his Alex Alexander Pentlin, and he wrote a book, um, you know, I think about six years ago, called the Social Physics, uh, uh, Social Physics, and and he was describing, you know, six or seven years ago, how just looking at mobile phone records, just movements using mobile phone data, you could predict when somebody was going to get sick. And you could predict when there was an emerging pandemic spreading. And you know, just from aggregating these data and, and, and studying the dynamic, because it turns out we are very habit-driven humans, we could begin to elicit information that would help us do healthcare much better. And th there are a thousand examples like that. And, um, and so I want to believe we could evolve to a space where we could uh, get the benefits of these data without the enormous cost that we're seeing right now, the cost of addiction. If anybody has not yet seen the film um, Social Dilemma, uh, yes. which, uh, 
which Tristan Harris, who I spoke about in my talk, is at the center of. Um, you absolutely need to see that film because that film, I think, is the best modern documentary capturing exactly the threat that this pre presents to our children and to ourselves and to our democracies. So I, I, I get the, the, the fear, but, um, but I also think that there's uh, an opportunity. And if we could just get sensible um, regulatory policy, which sounds oxymoronic in the American context today, but sensible regulatory policy, we could get some of the benefit without the enormous cost that we see spreading inside of our society right now. Yes, because of course there are some counterexamples of the positive aspect of such uh, platforms and company you seated. Uh, in a country exam, some revolution have been made possible thanks to Facebook, Twitter, such as the, in Egypt, Algeria, Tunisia. So in, my, in one way, it is a viable proof that such organization can enable democracy in some case. How do you analyze what happened concerning the Facebook revolution in, uh, in these countries? Well, all technology is Janice's face. Um, as my friend Aaron Swartz used to say, it's, uh, the internet is the best of all technologies and the worst of all technologies. Um, and I think the important thing is not to think of it uh, in natural terms, as if there's just a thing called the internet or just a thing called social media. Um, instead, recognize that the dynamics of the internet or the dynamics of social media um, are, are a function of their design. And they could be designed differently. So what makes social media so poisonous right now is, as I described in the talk, the business model of advertising. It is the business model of advertising that drives these platforms to try to extract from us as much data about us as they can so that they can offer advertisers much more valuable predictions about how we will behave. As Shoshana Zuboff puts it, it's a prediction mark. It's just, it's a, they're in the business of building models and they've built these algorithmic models that can predict exactly what you're going to do. People have this experience sometimes of talking in their phone about a certain vacation they wanna take. And then two minutes later, there's an advertisement for that vacation. And, and so they think, oh my gosh, they're listening to what I say on the phone. But it's even more creepy than that. It's not that they're listening to what's, what you're saying on your phone. They've built models of you that are so good that the models will predict that you actually are interested in going to Corsica and therefore they should be advertising uh, Corsica vacations to you. And, and so the point is that that, um, that, that development, that deep uh, uh, capacity is something that is, is driven by a business model. And you know, governments are pretty good at regulating business models. Governments could say in the context of politics, you can't sell ads like that or you can't sell targeted ads like that. Like France, of course, has a very well-regulated process for running elections, about television before the election, about free availability to that television, about banning all sorts of ads. None of those regulations are legal in the United States because of the way we've interpreted our free speech protections of the First Amendment. But I think they're extremely important in France. I think France could build on that capacity to begin to identify the kinds of advertising which would be appropriate in the context of these digital platforms, which would resist the ability of these platforms to advertise all the way down to the family level or the individual level, sending a special message to you and a different message to your spouse, um, but encourage advertising that would facilitate broad public statements of commitments and policies that polit politicians and, and parties are adopting. This is a design choice and it's designed right now by these platforms to maximize their own profit. But allowing them to maximize profit is not the objective of society. Society's objective should be to make sure that when they're doing that, they're not causing environmental disasters. And that's what these platforms have caused. Environmental disasters in the political context and uh, increasingly in the individual and social context as well. So what you're saying is that uh, uh, putting the lights on the advertiser themselves so that they take their, rents, their responsibilities in the way they uh, promote their product, uh, service and so on, is that the same thing or not exactly? I think that's second best. I mean, you, you know, we can embarrass um, corporations and say you shouldn't be supporting Facebook ads or something like that. I, the, the first best solution is just to regulate, to get the law right 
to get the law to step in and to, and to intervene where we can see the harm, the social harm that's being produced by the certain kind of behavior. And, you know, there's nothing sacrosanct about it. When the Internet was created, when, when Google was, was launched, they never thought they were going to be in an advertising business the way they're in an advertising business right now. It's just 20 years. And the idea that society is bending, is, is bending and, and democracy is under such threat because, you know, five companies want to make all the money in the world from advertising is just kind of crazy. I mean, there's no reason why we shouldn't be stepping up and saying enough enough of the poison that you're spewing into our society. And we have the right and indeed the obligation uh, as governments to assure that our societies are protected from these distorting uh, influences and the influences of, um, you know, there's, I just let me make sure this is very clear. In, in the film, Social Media, Tristan uh, Harris makes this point really powerfully. He said, you need to recognize that, um, you know, when you look at the computer screen, there are the most powerful AI technologies in history who are working to make you do what they want you to do. They're working to like trick you into watching something or to revealing this kind of information or sharing something with your friends. They are working as hard as they can because they have the capacity through these extraordinary algorithms to manipulate us. And as they manipulate us, they make tons of money, but they don't take account of the costs, whether it's the cost of the enormous insecurity that it causes young girls, you know, the suicide rate in, in America for young teenage girls, preteens and girls up to 15 has risen by three, by 180% um, over the past uh, decade um, because of, you know, the enormous insecurity that these technologies are seeding into our society. And we can't have governments that just sit back and let this happen. You know, it's an invading technology, an invading species. And we need to take responsibility for what it is doing in our society. And so far, governments are not. So in one way, they don't care about the externalities of their activities. It's not their, it's not their concern. So they should take care of the externalities of what they are doing. This is what you're describing. Is, is there a link also to what you told me in uh, our previous discussion when you re were referencing the fact that here in France, for example, we get a, we get a public health care so that when you are buying cigarettes or when you are smoking, yeah, the, the, the packets are all the same. Uh, so there is a public uh, regulation of that. Should we have a public re regulation such as the one we have on uh, like smoking or things like that, that can be applied to the digital world and the web companies? But well, let's first start with your point about externalities. That's exactly right. But it's nothing new. You know, the whole history of modern free society is recognizing that corporations, which have become, you know, enormously powerful global entities, um, corporations are not going to pay the costs of their externalities unless you make them. You know, and that's not because they're evil. It's because they live in a marketplace. So if all of a sudden a corporation, you know, if an oil company lives in a country that doesn't force it to clean up uh, because of the oil spills that it might uh, produce. If it's not forced to do that and it does it voluntarily, it's going to make less money than a competitor. And so the stock market's going to say, you're a less valuable corporation than your competitor. We're going to shift our investments over to your competitor. So the business is driven by the dynamic of the market to behave in uh, the least uh, socially uh, acceptable way. And so that's why you need regulation. You need to say to the oil company, you got to take account of your effect on the environment. And I wish we would say to all carbon companies, you need to take account of the carbon effect on the uh, uh, environment. And if you spew carbon, you must pay for it. Um, and that's the same thing with social media. These companies are not going to do it out of the good goodness of their heart. There is no heart in these corporations. They are machine, they are machines for printing money. And they will print as much as they can uh, subject to the constraints. And the constraints must come from law. They're not going to come from good, good souls or people saying they're going to be good people. We can't, these, are, these are not people. These are machines. And we have to regulate them like machines. Now, the right regulation is a complicated question. Um, you know, in the United States, um, 
the corporations during the lead up into the, the last election and then the lead up into the insurrection on January 6th were taking all sorts of steps to try to counter um, the lies that President Trump and his um, teams were spreading, lies about COVID, lies about the election results. And one thing they did is they just posted on every one of his tweets, um, you know, a little tag that said, um, this claim is disputed or this claim has been deemed false. Um, and their belief was that would help people like understand to discount what the president said. But in fact, I think it's more likely to have had the opposite effect, that the people who received those tweets with this, with this Twitter stamped um, disclaimer would think, oh, this is yet another example of the liberal technology companies resisting the power of the president. So my only point is it's a complicated question, exactly what the best way to respond is, but it's not a complicated question whether the government should respond. Mm. Now, 20 years ago, government said, well, we need to step back and we need to let the internet evolve and you know, let's take a hands-off uh, hands attitude. That time is over. It is over. And if governments are not taking the lead in figuring out how to tamp down the socially harmful effects from these technologies, you know, recognizing that they have enormous benefits, but the socially harmless, harmful effects, they are either corrupted or ignorant. Neither is acceptable. Mm. One way, uh, one most radical way might be, because I have two questions related to that. The first one is, do you think as some politician from the US that Facebook or other social network due to their monopolies should be dissolved? The other one is, uh, do you think there is a, a dismantling issue to, the, to, to limit the power of web companies? Could it be a solution to lower the power of their lobbies? Well, um, yes, I do absolutely believe antitrust has to come back to life. You know, I was special master in the Microsoft antitrust case for about six months, uh, 20 years ago. That was the last major technology antitrust case that the, the United States government brought 20 years ago. And in the 20 years since, we've seen these companies uh, exercise extraordinary monopoly power to gobble up potential competitors so that they control the field. And it, there is no excuse for the government standing back and doing nothing. Now, the reason the government does nothing is that in the United States, the government has been captured by, I think, a truly idiotic theory of antitrust, which basically asks, will the combination lower prices to consumers? And, and so under that standard, all of these combinations have lowered prices because basically the monopoly gives us everything and then steals our data in exchange. Um, instead of that theory of antitrust, I think the Europeans have been much better at aggressively uh, uh, trying to make sure that none of these companies get too big to regulate. And that's my biggest fear right now. My biggest fear is that if the United States finally woke up and realized the enormous threat that these technologies have created for our society and started to act against them, then these technology companies could begin to rally people against the government. And, and that's because they are so big and so powerful that I think they might even be more powerful than the power of government. Now, you know, most countries around the world would say, yeah, of course. Like, you know, what, what exactly is Switzerland supposed to do about Facebook? You know, there's nothing Switzerland can do about Facebook. Uh, and maybe there's nothing Britain can do about Facebook or France. Uh, uh, but the idea that the EU or, um, or the United States needs to wonder whether it actually has the governing sovereign power to deal with these global companies is astonishing. And it should be a wake up call that we can't allow these private power centers to become so powerful that even elected representative governments have no effective capacity to regulate them. But I think that's where we are right now. And we need to, you know, we need to wage the fight. Who knows whether we'll win? But we need to wage the fight to restore a capacity to insist that these technologies are good for society and rather than uh, turning us, as, as Huxley feared, into these uh, simple consumers of endless, mindless content.
You suddenly answer partially the, the, the last question, uh, the, the following question. Uh, the law being different from a country to another, but technology tools are still the same worldwide. How can we preserve our rights and prevent ourselves from the permanent hacking while using these tools? Yeah, I mean, one of the scariest things is that, um, you know, the government has become a surveillance engine on its own. You know, Edward Snowden risked his life, literally his life, um, and certainly has now given up his freedom and freedom to live in the society he wants to live in, um, in order to make a, make it a, a obvious to the world or release the information so the whole world would recognize the extraordinary steps the government, the United States government, um, in alliance with countries around the world has taken to basically build a perpetual surveillance infrastructure. Um, that makes it possible for them, maybe not in real time to know everything that's happening, but at least to have an archive so they can go back and figure out everything that's happening. And, and that um, capacity governments like because they like to be able to surveil cheaply and easily everything that there is to watch in the world. Uh, and so when, you know, when I say that the government needs to stand up to these private companies, the problem is the government is conflicted. The government on the one hand, when we're talking about like privacy commissioners, uh, is eager to talk about building a world where people don't worry that they're constantly being watched, that they're constantly living under surveillance. But on the security side of government, government's like, mm, actually, we kind of like that. We kind of like the world where we're perpetually watching the weird things you do so we know whether we need to think that you're you know, a terrorist associated with um, um, some uh, radical group or not. Um, uh, so I, I fear that the governments, too, are partially responsible for um, for the infrastructure of surveillance and um, and part of changing part of the change here is to is to is to figure out how to change government now how to do that well this is a question you were asking before about the power of lobbyists you know lobbyists have power because we've built our governments to be dependent on private interests to be able to get elected to government the United States members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70% of their time raising money to fund their campaigns. And they raise money not by calling average Americans, they raise money by calling the tiniest fraction of the 1% and sucking up to them, begging them, uh, is suggesting to them, you know, praising them and, and, and telling them exactly everything they're gonna do for them when they're in government in order to get their money to fund their campaigns. And what that means is the lobbyists in the American system have enormous power. All they have to do is to signal to the politicians that the money spigot will be turned off and the politicians will do anything they want for the lobbyists. So we're only gonna change the power of lobbyists when we change the dependence on go of government on wealth as the ticket for them to be in government. Um, and that's going to be an enormously difficult change to make. There's a very important bill in the United States right, uh, Senate right now called S-1. It would be a radical step in that direction. But of course, all the money in the world is rallied uh, against that change because of course, this is the simplest way for money to control government. Control the way politicians get to government so the politicians know they have to keep the money happy. One of the speakers said, uh, the mob is not is irrational. If you ask a lot of people, uh, what is the weight of myself, Christian Faure, and take the average number, it's probably the right answer. So can we say, uh, can we take the analogy and saying that, well, if you take the sum of the lobbies in general, uh, <laughs> they will act in the good of the global, uh, of the democracy, even if some of them are evil. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not saying I'm convinced by the, this argument, but I'm just asking the question. So I, I love large group arguments, um, but they always uh, talk about what constitutes the group. So if you have a perfectly representative sample of Americans um, who had a chance to have information given to them and a chance to talk about that information in small groups with other members of that public, I would completely commit to whatever that public agreed to um, and, uh, and, and believe in what that public would agree to, which is why you see movements, including in France right now, for um, what's called sortition or like randomly selected legislatures um, that would be representative 
um, and then have a chance to deliberate about uh, in the group about what what exactly uh, the result should be. But when the groups are not representative, um, and or more importantly, when you're talking about lobbyists, when they have a very particular objective, um, you can't rely on large groups to get you the right answer. I mean, the lobbyist objective is not to try to figure out what's good for the world or good for France or good for America. The lobbyist objective is to figure out how to increase profits to the clients who've, that have hired them. And so, you know, they're very good at that. They're very good at figuring out what will make more money for that company. But we need to realize that what makes money for a company is a very different question from what is good for society. And if we can't break that uh, connection down and understand that the answer to one has got to be considered separately from the answer to the other, then we're, then we're truly lost. Because um, I, I fear that the corporations have been so good at convincing us they are the good guys. And I don't think they're the bad guys. I just think that they are the machines driven towards making money. And we realize that when they pursue their objective of making money, that objective quite often is destructive to society, which is why we need to tame them. You know, they're like, you know, like a, there's all these, always these stories in the United States of, of families who like bring home tigers, like tiger pups, tiger kittens, and they let their kids play with them. And then the tigers grow up and surprise, surprise, a child is mauled by the tiger. And then they're like, oh my God, that terrible tiger. And of course the response is not, the tigers are terrible. Tigers are tigers. This is their nature. This is what they do. They come to a certain point and they're going to be aggressive. And so, no, you can't have tigers playing with children. Um, and that's the same thing with corporations. Corporations aren't evil. Corporations are just machines driven to profit. And we need to, try, we need to cage that profit motive to make sure that when they do that, they're not harming society. Okay. That's the metaphor of the frog and the Scorpio. I don't know if you heard about it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's my nature. It's my uh, nature. It's uh, just to uh, to notice that someone is saying that there is uh, there are already countries controlling it and their social media and communication and of course it's not the example and the counter example that we are taking and and we should go in that direction. I think it's clear for for everybody. Maybe we still have four minutes, uh, Larry, uh, concerning the let's say the the bid and tax uh, on cooperation. Uh, is that uh, is that going for you in the in the right direction? to uh, to have these uh, tax uh, policies uh, concerning cooperation? Well, I certainly think that the United States has made an enormous mistake in cutting taxes on the wealthiest, uh, including corporations. I think it's a disaster. Um, and uh, what it's done is produce um, uh, radical inequalities in wealth in the United States, as great as anything we've seen in the last 120 years. Um, and part of the... Um, Uh, part of the um, unraveling that's happening in the United States that, you know, produced the election of Donald Trump is a product of this extraordinary and gross inequality. Um, and so, yes, tax changes to address that inequality, including rolling back corporate taxes to, you know, where they were under Obama, basically, um, uh, would, I think, be one step forward. But it's a tiny, tiny step. You know, we should realize... Joe Biden, I think, is a great president. He will be one of the greatest presidents uh, uh, of the last hundred years, no doubt. But he is operating with a deeply, deeply dysfunctional Congress. And so um, what he can get from Congress is just crumbs compared to what we need to get, to get us to a, to a government and to a society and to regulations of technologies like I've been describing that make sense. Um, and so, you know, he's pushing where he can make progress. And I think that if we could address the deeply dysfunctional democracy problems in the United States, he could make more progress, which is why I think it's very important for him to push democracy reform as one of the first things he pushes, which is what he's doing right now. Um, but, uh, but these changes are just the first baby steps in the changes that we need to get us back to a well-functioning representative democracy. Talking about baby steps, and in just one minute, I'm sorry for the time constraint, how could education be part of the solution? Do you have some sp specific initiative related to education, the young population, and so on? I think the biggest thing education can do 
is to enable kids to talk to each other about what they understand is happening to them. I, I think, you know, education now is not about filling people's heads with facts. Education is about giving people the capacity to work together to address common problems. And that means giving them infrastructure to facilitate that deliberation. Uh, and, and I hope that happens soon because, you know, the reality is kids understand these issues orders of magnitude better than their parents. Uh, and so rather than relying on people who have an image of the internet from the 1990s, we need kids who like experience it every day, increasingly participating in the conversation about how we could turn it into something useful and not something so destructive of our society. Okay, thank you very much, Larry. Thank you. For, I enjoyed this discussion, and I discovered a gentle and very kind person uh, behind the great professor. Thank you very much for being with us. It was really a joy to have you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you.